Good morning, members of the jury. At the close, uh, when we closed yesterday, the state of Iowa had rested its case in state of Iowa versus Jerry Lynn Burns. And now at this time, uh, Mr. Spees, if you choose to, uh, you may present your case. Thank you, Your Honor. The uh, defense called Dr. Michael Spence. Good morning, sir. Please morning. pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and take a seat in that witness chair. <clears throat> there are just a couple of expectations in the courtroom when you are a witness. Uh, please allow <clears throat> whichever attorney is asking you questions to finish the question before you begin your answer. They'll give you the same courtesy of uh, allowing you to finish your answer before they ask the next question. Obviously, there's a microphone in front of you. That's because we all want to hear your testimony. Uh, and with that, would you please state your full name and spell your first and last names for the record? Yes, my name is Dr. Michael J. Spence. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L. And the last name is S-P-E-N-C-E. -E. Thank you. You may conduct your direct examination, Mr. Spies. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Spence, uh, you're here to uh, help us understand some important issues in this case. And before we get uh, into the meat of those issues, please tell us uh, what your professional address is. My professional location? Yes. Uh, is in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And are you a native of New Mexico? Uh, you might say that. I was born in Baltimore, but I grew up in the Southwest. And uh, where do you uh, currently office? Uh, in, in my home in, in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Okay. Could you tell us, uh, uh, Doctor, your, your educational background that leads you to the position that you hold now? Yes, uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Both of those are in microbiology, uh, and both of those are from UT El Paso. Uh, I then went on to earn a PhD in molecular biology, and that's from New Mexico State University, which is there in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Now, you mentioned U of T. Uh, T is for Texas, right? That's correct. Okay. And um, could you tell us about the, uh, the work that you've uh, been engaged in since you obtained your doctorate? Uh, once I finished my doctorate, I went on to what's called uh, postdoctoral uh, positions, and I got a research position uh, at the University of Vermont Medical School, worked there for four years. I then went on to another position that was in Boise, Idaho, at the Boise VA Medical Center, uh, and that was for eight additional years. Uh, so I did a lot of research, and uh, all related to DNA. Uh, more and more so as time went on, it became more and more cancer research related. And in, in connection with your work in uh, cancer DNA and uh, biology, did you uh, participate in research that led to the publication of any scientific <clears throat> articles? Yes, I have 14 published articles. Some of those were earlier that weren't uh, related to cancer. Uh, a lot of those were, were later, uh, mostly at Boise, that re did relate to cancer. And in addition, uh, and important for your work here this uh, morning, have you done any writing or publication in the field of forensic biology and forensic DNA? Uh, yes, since the uh, latter part of 2015, I've been working on a chapter uh, that is going to be published later in the year, probably summer, late summer is w what's being targeted. Uh, uh, the title of the chapter is Chapter 8, Forensic Use of DNA, and it's going to be published by uh, Thompson Reuters, uh, along with a, a lot of other topics in medicine, psychology, and psychiatry from other authors across the country. And, uh, you know, kind of leaping from your early uh, research and work in cancer uh, research, how did you become involved in forensic DNA casework? And by forensic, we mean legal connections. Yes, I was in Idaho working on the cancer research project that I had, uh, and I started looking around at uh, law enforcement positions because DNA was becoming a big part of law enforcement investigations. Uh, so I looked ar around at various uh, law enforcement facilities and settled on the Indiana State Police, and they settled on me and gave me a position uh, in May of 2003 and assigned me to their Evansville Regional Lab. And where was that regional lab located, Doctor? That's the southern tip of the, of the state, uh, pretty close to Kentucky, or very close to Kentucky. So what kind of work did you do for the uh, Indiana State Police? Well, I had quite a bit of experience on working with DNA, but I had a lot to learn about uh, how 
uh, things work in a law enforcement lab, about chain of custody, uh, about how to handle evidence and look for body fluids. Wasn't typical what I had been doing in cancer research, but identifying body fluids and ultimately doing their specialized techniques for extracting DNA, uh, quantifying how much DNA is there in each sample, and then ultimately doing the typing uh, that I'm sure the jury's probably already heard some about, uh, and uh, uh, making comparisons between knowns and uh, known individuals and what's on the evidence and reporting that and then when needed testifying to it. So in your work uh, with the Indi Indiana State Police, did you have to get some specialized training to acquaint yourself with all the topics you just mentioned? Yes. And what kind of training did you receive for that? Uh, there was a training program just to begin with, with what they call serology. Uh, and it's sort of a misused term because that's the study of blood. But the, the body fl fluid part, the, the uh, evidence examination part. So I needed to be uh, have a deep understanding that the evidence can be anything. It can be garments, it can be shoes, it can be weapons, uh, it can be swabs collected from various areas, and I needed to understand how to process those and examine those, uh, look for stains on some items, uh, and then ultimately use the specialized techniques. As I mentioned, the extractions were a little bit different than I was used to, and then the typing and comparisons was definitely a new thing to me. Again, again how long were you with the um, Indiana... Uh, State Police Crime Laboratory. Uh, that began in May of 2003 uh, and went through May of 2007, so four years. After uh, your work at the Indiana State Police Crime Laboratory, where did you go from there in your professional life? Uh, well, for the most part, I was homesick and wanted to go back to New Mexico and had a position there that was uh, uh, very suitable. Uh, so I left in May of, of 07 and took a position as a technical leader, techn technical manager of a startup lab uh, the laboratory there was already doing parentage testing. Uh, what they wanted to do is spin off uh, a lab that could do outsource DNA testing for uh, criminal cases, either for, uh, to, to help with backlogs for crime labs or to help with defense testing. And so I worked there for about eight months before I uh, turned in my resignation and um, started doing what I'm doing right now, and that was February of 2008. So since February of 2008, have you uh, been Self-employed? Yes. And tell the men and women of the jury about uh, uh, the, just generally the nature of the work that you do now. I launched my company, uh, Spence Forensic Resources, and that's based out of Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I provide consulting for uh, whoever calls who has a need to understand the technology associated uh, usually with criminal cases, but it can be also civil cases that involves uh, body fluids, typing DNA, uh, and the investigation of DNA uh, for the purpose of human identification. Uh, and as I said, usually uh, for criminal cases, I've been doing that for 12 years now. In uh, connection with the work that you do now, doctor, do you, do, uh, do you actually have a laboratory where you do lab work? I do not. And so the, uh, the work that you do now in consultation involves, as you said, uh, mostly criminal cases and occasionally civil cases? Yes. Could you estimate for the uh, men and women of the jury the number of DNA-related criminal cases or civil cases in which you've consulted? Uh, consulted or at least, I'd say, reviewed. There was a lot of peer review that I did with the Indiana State Police uh, and then a lot more cases in the last 12 years. Usually, as you said, criminal cases, it's uh, come to uh, uh, about 1,025. And how many open DNA cases are you working on right now? Uh, about 40. So you are obviously here at our request, and um, have you ever provided consultation services to prosecutors or to state law enforcement agencies? Not as an independent consultant over the last 12 years, but the first uh, 16 cases that I testified in uh, and all the cases that I worked on where I didn't testify were for the Indiana State Police, but over the last 12 years, uh, it's, it's been uh, usually defense cases. If the prosecution asks you to consult with them uh, about a forensic DNA matter, would you do so? Yes, it would be the first time, but I would gladly do that, yes. Okay. Do you uh, charge for your work? Yes, I do. And how do you charge for your work? Uh, my rate is 300 per hour. Uh, I reduce that to 150 per hour for my travel time. Uh, and uh, occasionally I do a pro bono case. There are some that I'm continuing to work on, but the vast majority of my cases are at that rate. All right. And doctor, uh, how do you maintain proficiency in the work that you do? 
by that I mean professional proficiency. There are a lot of ways to do that. I maintain no proficiency on doing hands-on work. There are mechanisms to do that, but as a consultant, it's not really necessary. I don't have a lab. Uh, so what I do is I have to do a lot of reading. Uh, that, there was a lot of reading involved just in preparing the chapter that I'm writing, and I've reread that uh, more times than I even care to admit. Uh, but I do uh, read a lot of journal articles. Those are available through services, uh, through the internet, typically um, for free, peer-reviewed scientific uh, articles through something called Science Direct or ResearchGate. Uh, I also uh, have relationships with people out there who work in outsource labs where they do research. Uh, I at least know them through email and so forth, and I send papers to them, they send papers to me. But really just the casework is probably the biggest uh, way to keep up and understand what's going on in forensic biology and DNA, looking at so many cases in so many states from so many labs. Um, I'm looking at not only their standard operating procedures, their SOPs, I'm looking at their technical manuals and how they do the work in each individual case. So there's a lot to be learned from within there, within the documents, and I'm continually uh, looking at many, many cases. Okay. In fact, uh, you uh, anticipated a question I was going to ask a little bit later about what you reviewed in this case, but would that be uh, typical of the type of work that you do in a consultation case like this one, reviewing all of that type of evidence, that type of uh, documentation? Yes. Okay. Do you often have uh, other professionals review your work? Uh, sometimes I have other professionals look at some parts of my work, but typically I'm, I'm working entirely on my own. I have an assistant who helps me, and uh, this assistant is administrative, not scientific. Uh, so the review of my work is really uh, through any instances where I'm asked to write a report, uh, if there's a report to review, or um, if I am interviewed sometimes by opposing counsel, that's an opportunity to review what I've looked at, uh, or what I'm doing right now. I'm testifying. Uh, there's an opportunity to have analysts listen in on what uh, um, what I've done on the case, what my assessments are, what my opinions are, and respond to those. Okay. How many different laboratories uh, whose work was in question have you reviewed? I'd say about 85. It's probably coming up on 90, uh, but it's at least 85. And how many different states have those laboratories been located? Uh, in 30 different states. Okay. Have you testified in uh, court uh, before as a DNA forensic expert? Yes, I have. Including in Iowa? Yes, one time in Idaho. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep, I keep saying that, Iowa. I used to live in Idaho, sorry. <laughs> well, it's a, a mistake often made. <laughs> um, so you, you have, have testified in court a number of times, and have you been qualified to testify in those situations in specialized areas of DNA forensic science? Yes, I qualified on 16 occasions uh, with the Indiana State Police and 119 additional occasions since then. Uh, and the yeah, other specialized areas, such as uh, minimizing contamination in the handling and testing of DNA, uh, DNA mixture analysis, uh, something that's called YSTR analysis, which isn't associated with this case, but it's, uh, also DNA transfer events. Okay. Yeah, now, in the situations in which you've consulted in these uh, hundreds of cases, have you always found something wrong? No, uh, often the, the, there's nothing wrong with the work, there's nothing wrong with the interpretation, and just as a gauge, uh, only about 15% of the cases I'm needed to testify. The other 85%, um, it's not necessary for me to travel anywhere and, and uh, provide testimony. And is that because there's just uh, no issue that arises in the case? For the most part, or if there's issues, I can describe those to counsel and they may, they may not need me to come in and talk about that. Okay, so if I may approach your honor, you may. I'm uh, handing you uh, Dr. Spence, uh, what's been labeled as Defendant's Exhibit S1. If you would take a moment to familiarize yourself with that and tell the men and women of the jury and us what that is. Yes, this is my curriculum vitae, my, my resume. This uh, summarizes your professional experience and background? Yes, it does. Okay. We offer uh, Defendant's Exhibit S1. Has the state had an opportunity to review S1? Yes, and we have no objection. That's one will be received and made part of the record. So, um, Doctor, you're here for a very important reason, and um, just to give uh, some additional background, I've re uh, we've retained you to assist in our understanding of some scientific and forensic issues in this case. 
Uh, what have you done to familiarize yourself with the issues you're about to talk with us about? Well, I've reviewed the case file and the reports, and I've discussed this with uh, defense counsel as to what the circumstances of the case were. Okay. Have you prepared any written reports about your, your case work here? No, no, I have not. Um, and by the case file, would the case file include the information that was obtained from the uh, State Division of Criminal Investigation here in Iowa, the uh, outsourcing of the scientific research done by DNA Labs, Bodhi Technology, uh, Parabon, all of that material? Yes, to varying degrees. I've reviewed those. I had a big file folder as I walked in. It's down there. I won't pick it up, but it's, it's a lot of material, yes. And I did look through some of those materials very carefully and other materials I, I glanced through just to identify what they were. Okay. Now, based on your, your education and your training and your experience, have you reached some opinions in this case that would be, in your opinion, helpful to the jury? Yes, I do. And the opinions that you hold in this case, do you hold them to a degree of scientific certainty? Yes, I do. Including the scientific analysis of critical items of evidence in this case? Yes. And about the crime scene itself? Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, doctor, would it be helpful to the uh, men and women of the jury to have a, a rough illustration of some of the issues you're going to be talking about today? Absolutely. Okay. If we could uh, uh, present a demonstrative exhibit, Your Honor. You may. Has the state had an opportunity to review the demonstrative aid? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. There above your uh, left shoulder, uh, Dr. Spence, is a, a, a diagram. And uh, could you, in general terms, explain what uh, this diagram represents? Yes, you, you see in the center, that's the most important part. It says trace DNA. And that's a little vague, but we're talking about small amounts of DNA in some instances uh, that are going to be detected on criminal case evidence. As we go around, uh, there are uh, descriptions of ways that trace amounts of DNA, and sometimes more than trace amounts of DNA, can arrive on those items that are being analyzed. It, it can be from coughs, sneezes, uh, speaking, as I'm doing right now. I'm sure my DNA is right here on this uh, microphone head. Uh, Touching, we, we know now that uh, things you touch, you're going to leave behind skin cells. Uh, dilute fluids, and this would refer to body fluids, presumably. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, sweat, blood, semen, saliva. Uh, there are other body fluids that are involved. Uh, mucus. Um, there can be indirect transfer. So you can have DNA transferred from a person onto an object through any of those mechanisms I just described, and then transferred subsequently to another uh, object. And this has been tested in, in research studies uh, way too many times, probably, uh, the hundreds of papers that have come out, research papers on that. Uh, and, and just talking about the kind of objects we can see from one person to another person, you can get DNA on onto another person from the, the first person. Shaking hands is an easy example. Hugging. Uh, at crime scenes, there can be transfer events from people who arrive at that, uh, that crime scene. Uh, prior to the crime scene, during the crime scene, after the crime scene, there can be transfer events. These are concerns for handling DNA as far as contamination for the people who collect crime scene evidence. Uh, so these are, these are all objects and persons that can uh, have an effect on what we ultimately see on, on items at the, at the end, where we're taking a snapshot essentially, with our DNA typing as to what's on that item at the very end of the, at the analytical step. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're going to ask you uh, this morning to focus on some specific items of evidence, in particular a very important item of evidence 
and this is the uh, dress that Michelle Martinko was wearing when she was killed in uh, 1979. Um, I think it'll be helpful for us to focus on the clothing that she wore and in particular spots on that uh, clothing, okay? Okay. Um, we know that at the time of her death, she was wearing this dress and that eventually <clears throat> crime scene analysts were able to focus on a spot which is now known as spot F5 on this dress. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Uh, very much so. And the uh, testimony and the evidence uh, introduced in the trial so far showed that the uh, dress was removed from Ms. Martinko at her autopsy. It was uh, turned over to law enforcement. It was uh, dried at the police department, and then it was uh, at some point packaged by identification officers, what are now called maybe crime scene technicians, uh, there at the Cedar Rapids Police Department. I'd like you to take a look, uh, first of all, at <coughs> Exhibit 17K, if I may approach. You may. And if you would take a moment, uh, Dr. Spence, to familiarize yourself with uh, 17K, may we publish that, Your Honor? You may. Yes. And 17K has been uh, described um, as a, I guess, a black and white photo of the outside packaging of some of the clothing that was worn by Ms. Martinko. And if you look at the um, very bottom of 17K, there is a, an evidence tag that shows 12-19-79. Uh, if you look over your shoulder there, you can see the highlighted portions. And yes. Beneath that 12-19-80. The yes. uh, testimony in, in the case showed that, of course, 12-19-79 was the date of the, the homicide, and an identification officer testified he wasn't sure if that 12-19-80 date was the date that the clothing was originally packaged or if that was a, a misprint. He just didn't recall. But you understand at least the at some point, the items were packaged um, within a year of the homicide, right? Uh, it would appear based on what's on the tag, yes. Sure. And then further up on uh, Exhibit 17K, we uh, have another notation made by Identification Officer Murphy. And is your understanding that these items of clothing were repackaged in 1996? That's my understanding. I've seen that on descriptions of how the, the item was handled, and, and you see that right there on the packaging right. photo. And uh, so this would have been uh, some years later. Uh, by the way, Identification Officer Murphy testified that the reason the items were repackaged because the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation no longer wanted to have staples in the bags, and they also wanted to uh, mark it as a biohazard. So that was the explanation given for it being repackaged. Um, is it correct from your understanding that the clothing that Ms. Martinko was wearing was bundled together or packaged together? Yes, that's my understanding. And if we could um, take a look at the Exhibit 17E. Sorry, not 17E. If we're, we're going to uh, kind of jump ahead here to get to the critical time period, um, is it correct that the contents of that package, including the clothing, were examined about two years later in 1997? Yes, that's correct. And um, it was again examined in about 2002? That's correct. Again in about 2003? Yes. And then uh, finally, again in 2005? Yes, I wouldn't say finally, but uh, the next one sure. that was a, of importance was 05, yes. And in your work in this case, did you follow the, the, those sequence of events in your work? Those were very important dates, yes, for, for uh, a forensic biologist, DNA scientist like myself to, to focus on. All right. And we also understand from the testimony uh, in this case that in about 2008, some of the evidence in the case was affected by a flood in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Are you familiar with that, too? I'm familiar with that there was an issue with that, yes. Um, now, importantly, we've heard, and as uh, demonstrated by the packaging, that the items of Ms. Uh, Martinko's clothing, her dress, her 
uh, underpants or um, pantyhose uh, were bundled together at various times during the packaging and repackaging. Can you let us know your thoughts from a scientific point of view, Dr. Spence, about the issue of bundling items like this together? Yes, it's, it's improper, uh, especially for uh, the, the modern day uh, analysis. And by modern day, I'm talking about uh, coming into the late 90s and beyond, uh, just as a, a, to, to put down a, a time, not an exact time date, but in that range. Uh, things shouldn't be packaged in that way. They should be separated out. And if uh, something is packaged, of course, in 1960 or 1979, uh, people weren't aware who were working scenes that, that uh, the prominence that DNA was going to gain over the next few decades. But as those items are opened up, it is best at some point, it's better late than never, to uh, separate out uh, the individual clothing items into separate packages. Now, um, a retired uh, criminalist, uh, Linda Sauer, testified to, to the men and women of the jury that, and she, of course, did a lot of the identification evidence you're going to be talking about, said that if the items are in a dry state, that is, if they're not moist, that biologic material that might be on those clothes will not transfer. Was she right? No, that's completely incorrect. That is not what the research has told us. And as the, the sensitivity of DNA typing is uh, going up uh, higher and higher sensitivity over the years, over the decades, that's clearly not correct. Our ability to detect things even back in the early 2000s was at a point where uh, you no know, dry transfer of DNA has been established through research and through looking at casework. We know that happens. And we also had uh, testimony from Identification Officer Murphy, who testified that if all the clothing came from the same person, that that wasn't a problem. Was he correct? I disagree with that completely. Why is that? I, I think that you need to separate out the items as early as you possibly can. I can understand why law enforcement officers in 1979 might not have thought of that. But as we've developed the, the testing methods, and as soon as this, it was noted that all these items were bundled together, they should have been unbundled and put into separate packages. It's vital to do that. Now, is this based on your opinion and your, your knowledge, or is, as you said, is this notion of uh, transfer and contamination substantiated by other research? Yeah, the, the, the idea of uh, dry transfer of DNA, and that doesn't diminish the fact that uh, damp sources of DNA certainly can be transferred even more readily, but dry transfer of DNA, there are uh, articles on that, hundreds and hundreds of them, and just to focus on a recent review article, there were 298 uh, previous articles that were cited in that, and it's the research on uh, the actual casework and re uh, the uh, research studies on transfer of DNA, it's very prevalent, and this can happen uh, in situations especially where you're bundling different items together. And the article that you just referred to, is this uh, in an um, authoritative research journal? This was a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And was it authored by people who are authoritative in the field? Well, the particular one I'm referring to, which is out of January of uh, 19, uh, was authored by essentially the, the most renowned people working on DNA transfer events. And there's a lot of individuals doing that, but the ones who are the most prolific <coughs> in uh, generating information on the understanding of transfer events were those individuals. So when we talk about transfer events, we're meaning uh, DNA going from one location to another location? Yes, much like the, the, the diagram that we saw that uh, said trace DNA in the middle. Now, you mentioned um, dry uh, transfer. Could you be more specific about what you mean by dry transfer? Uh, well, you can have, uh, that, that's a good question. You can have, uh, first of all, just skin cells transferred directly. If I touch this glass, I'm going to be uh, having a dry transfer of skin cells from me onto the surface of this, this cup. You know that's going to happen. Uh, this is because uh, the average human, from head to toe, uh, sloughs off, sheds uh, about 2 million cells per minute. So items that get touched and the items, the clothing items that I'm wearing, I'm going to be transferring my skin cells onto my own clothing. We know that. Other types of transfer can involve uh, something like body fluids, 
uh, that can get onto an item, and then that becomes very dry over time. But still, when those items come into contact with other people or other items, there can be a secondary transfer event of the what was in those body fluids, whether we're talking about sweat, music, uh, mucus, saliva, uh, blood, semen, uh, and we know these dry transfers do occur, whether it f was originally from a body fluid or whether it's from skin cells. So you mentioned uh, the, uh, the, uh, the article. Is the recognition of how frequent uh, dry transfer occurs becoming more and more uh, prevalent in, in crime laboratories across the United States? Yes, within that article they referred to, uh, first of all, the, the doubts that there were over the years that really these transfer events are really that prevalent but it has become very clear through the research that it is very prevalent and law enforcement has responded. Investigators who work crime scenes know that they can swab off steering wheels, doorknobs, uh, collect clothing where they're not necessarily looking for a body fluid on the clothing, but just uh, who wore the clothing. And because of that, in the modern day, uh, from this uh, research, uh, uh, review article that I looked at within the introduction, they state, that more than half of the evidence that are in crime labs are believed to be from some sort of dry transfer, touch, handling kind of event, as opposed to a blood drop that's swabbed off of a floor, that's body fluid, or sexual assault cases where they're looking for semen, for example, that's body fluids. But more than half of the items in crime labs now are looking for the dry transfer handling events. And would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I've seen in the casework. Uh, uh, more so, uh, as the years go by, there's more and more of those types of items are the focus of investigations. So we're going to turn now to the meat of the case, uh, Dr. Spence, and um, <clears throat> we've heard uh, testimony from retired criminalist uh, Linda Sauer about her work in the case, and I'd like to direct your attention to her work in, uh, first of all, 2003, and if I may approach, Your Honor. You may. I'm going to hand you <coughs> States Exhibit Number 9C, and if you would take a minute to acquaint yourself with that, please. Yes, I've reviewed this. Okay, and uh, tell us what the 9C is. Uh, this is one of the many reports that were released, but I believe it's the only report from 2003, uh, signed by Ms. Sauer. And if we may uh, publish that, Your Honor. You may. Uh, up on the screen now, uh, above your left shoulder, uh, Dr. Spence is the 9C, and uh, highlighted there is the date of September 8, 2003. This is the report that Ms. Uh, Sauer prepared in her work in 2003. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And um, in that report, she identifies that uh, she received the scarf and the pantyhose and I uh, believe there were other items uh, attached as well. <clears throat> Do you remember that? Yes, a scarf, uh, pantyhose, the panties, and the dress were, were in that one uh, package F. Okay. I'd uh, like you next to look at um, States Exhibit 9C2. These have been identified as uh, Ms. Sauer's uh, bench notes from August of uh, 2003. Are you familiar with those? Yes, I've reviewed these as well. And uh, Ms. Sauer testified that these were her handwritten comments of how she examined the uh, evidence in that case. And I'm going to ask you some specific questions about those as well. Can you get that up? Uh, again, above your left uh, shoulder is uh, State's Exhibit 9C2. And uh, these are the bench notes, right? That's correct. And in the uh, bench notes, it um, appears that she noted that the items had been repackaged in uh, 1994. Do you see that highlighted? Yes, I do. And um, again, uh, you've talked about the risk of repackaging. What are the risk of packaging and repackaging items, like clothing? Well, for each time that you open it up and take things out, uh, when you have to put them back in, and that's where I'm saying if you put them all back in together again the way they were, uh, there's just more opportunities for there to be contact between various items, and we know there are four items here, uh, and they're going to be squished together as you 
uh, get that sealed tight and and uh, and, and seal the out, outer edges of the package. Uh, and that's going to be stored for however long it is before you open it up and take them out again. This is where I was saying it's best to, at that point, when you take them out and you recognize that there are t distinct items, it's a, and you're going to repackage them anyway, perhaps for good reason, uh, go ahead and repackage them in separate packages. And again, up, up over your left shoulder, we have highlighted uh, uh, four uh, references to what she examined on that date. And, and can you tell us uh, what uh, she examined on the date of uh, this lab note? Well, at, at least what she focused or examined on is one thing. But what she what she's uh, inventorying here within the package is the black dress, uh, the matching scarf or wrap, uh, the uh, pair of pantyhose, uh, and a pair of panties. Uh, and then it mentions that there were digital photos. Um, the amount of examination that went beyond that is a separate issue, but this is basically an in inventory of what was found within that package F. Now, notable, uh, again, in the uh, bottom highlighted portion there, she said uh, no exams on F2 and F3 at this time. And I think that F2 was the matching scarf and F3 was the pantyhose. So she did not examine those? Yeah, that's where I was making that note, and she's making that note. Those two items were uh, not going to be examined at the time, but the other two were. Okay. In her uh, lab notes, I think on the next uh, page, she mentions uh, using an ALS or view dress with ALS. Could you tell us uh, what ALS is? Uh, this is an alternate light source. Uh, and uh, maybe a, a lot of you know what a black light is, and that's a similar thing, although it's just uh, a wavelength or maybe a couple of wavelengths that are available on a black light. Uh, these are much more sophisticated. They have much more settings of different wavelengths, and they help to illuminate items so that perhaps you can uh, see uh, discolorations on any kind of given item that you're examining. Now, um, I use a black light, as I uh, mentioned earlier, to look for urine spots for my dog, but uh, the alternate light source used in a situation like this, would it make blood glow? But no, it, it won't. Gl uh, but blood is going to have the completely absolute, uh, uh, opposite effect. When you have uh, an item that has blood on it, it's going to pretty much absorb all the light, and uh, it's going to appear black. Uh, and we're talking about, uh, just to give you the idea, you're t turning out all the the laboratory lights. So you're not using high intensity light to look at the uh, item. You might have already done that, but for this ALS, you're going to switch off all the lights and use only that source on given items. And you can find uh, body fluids that fluoresce, but blood is going to go the opposite direction and appear very dark on, on an object. So when Ms. Sauer testified about her examination of the dress, she talked about looking for texture. And what do you understand to be uh her looking for texture on a black dress? Uh, well, typically you're going to look for any kind of fluorescence if it's a body fluid that fluoresces or if it absorbs the light like blood does, you'll look for the blackness of it. But we've got a dress that uh, we can all see is very dark. So that's going to make it very challenging to see where blood stains begin and end. So looking at the texture is a very intuitive thing for any analyst to do, is to, to see if there's uh, some kind of textural clues that there might be some kind of a deposit somewhere on a partic particular area of, of the uh, garment you're looking at. Based on what you saw from the lab notes and what you saw from the uh, other records that you reviewed, was it uh, plain to you that Ms. Sauer made a thorough examination of the dress in 2003? Uh, very thorough, yes. Did she uh, note anything about any uh, blood spots on the back of the dress, as you recall? Uh, I believe that there was one area that was looked at on the back of the dress, uh, but it's not the one that, we, uh, that we're most concerned about that comes later. Uh, I believe it's the F4 area, and there's a little confusion there because there's items named F. So it's area F4 on the dress, uh, which was a pretty distinct, uh, I believe she used the word in, in her uh, description, obvious. Uh, blood-stained area uh, and did test positive for blood. And I believe that in her report, uh, Exhibit 9C, that she identified that the four spots that she located on the dress <clears throat> were all um, determined to be the blood of Michelle Martinko. Yes, there's three blood stains on the front 
and one on the back, and all those did type uh, to Ms. Martinko. Now, in Exhibit uh, 9C, I think that she also mentions that uh, she located spermatozoa in the underpants uh, item <coughs> F, <coughs> excuse me, F4. Yeah, and that's where the confusion comes in. It's item F4 as opposed to area F4 on the dress. It's item F4, and yes, she did visualize uh, sperm cells under the microscope on that particular item. Did she explore that <coughs> at all? Uh, she did. And did she make any findings about the spermatozoa? Well, beyond uh, noting the presence of spermatozoa and that there were small numbers of them, uh, she did conduct uh, typing on uh, those. She performed a specialized extraction of DNA that would try to isolate and concentrate out the, the spermatozoa into one fraction, whereas the other fraction would be what we call a non-sperm fraction. Uh, that uh, wasn't really worth looking at, but the sperm fraction, she did see evidence of male DNA, but it was, um, it was not conclusive at all. It was, it was a very weak profile. Okay. So <clears throat> you described for us the manner in which she examined the dress, and based on the documentation that you've looked at, doctor, uh, do you have any quarrel with her examination of the dress in 2003? No, I do not. Um, the next report of her evaluation of, of the dress was in December of 2005. And if we could have exhibit uh, 9D, if I may approach. Can I say D or B? I'm sorry. D or B? D. I'll take those away. Taking a look at uh, exhibit, state's exhibit number 9D, can you tell the court and the men and women of the jury what that is? Yes, it's a subsequent report that's released on December 5th of 2005. And does this uh, also include examination of, of the, the, the dress again, Exhibit F? Yes, it does. And uh, from your review of uh, Exhibit 9D, did she also reach some additional con new conclusions about Exhibit F? Yes, she refers to previous conclusions from the previous report. Uh, there's a couple of reports that we had looked at here just now, uh, but uh, indicated that there were additional screening tests uh, looking for uh, blood on various parts of the dress. All right. And uh, now I'm going to approach and hand you Exhibit 9D1. And uh, tell us again what the Exhibit 9D1 is. Well, similar to what we just talked about with the report and then the, the corresponding bench notes, we have a report here from December of 05, and we have the corresponding bench notes, which are dated uh, October 31st, 05. So as she was going through the items, these are the notes that she took, uh, and then um, the report came out subsequently to that. Could you tell us uh, in, in general, uh, if I may uh, publish 91, Your Honor? You may. Uh, what she did in examining the dress in October of uh, 2005? Uh, when she examined the, the dress, uh, she's uh, moving on to other areas uh, that could be identified on the dress where she uh, uh, perhaps had uh, textural issues that she's looking for. As I mentioned, it's going to be difficult with the uh, bright lights of the lab or the ALS to identify where any blood stains are, but she's picking out new areas to uh, collect samples and run examinations for body fluids or DNA or both. Now, uh, in the bench notes and, of course, in her report, she notes that she again located blood that she attributed to Michelle Martinko. Is that right? Uh, yes, she did. And she also identified um, a new spot on the back of the dress uh, that she labeled F5. Is that accurate as well? Yeah, and to be, to be clear, we're talking about area F5 on, on the dress, and this as it, it is at the lower back near the seam area in the middle of the back of the dress. Can you tell from the bench notes, um, Dr. Spence, how she went about identifying F5, location F5, and how she determined that it was or was not blood? Uh, it, it's not clear on exactly uh, what she did at the F5 area as far as identifying any kind of textural issue or anything. Uh, and it's not clear that she even did run presumptive tests for blood, but the, it's, it's in the report that she did uh, collect samples and test for blood. Um, now, she talked uh, in her testimony about how she marked different uh, areas on the dress. Sometimes she would circle areas with 
white, a white pen or white uh, marker of some sort. Um, are you aware whether or not she marked the area F5 with any kind of a marker? I've seen no photos. Uh, I've seen photos of where F5 is and close-ups of what it looks like today and previous photos from back in 15 years ago. And I've never seen any white markings in that area. In uh, <clears throat> the exhibit that we have up on the screen, this is exhibit uh, 9D1, she mentions that she screened positive for blood uh, those new areas, number five, number six, number seven, and number eight. She uh, told the men and women of the jury that in, in screening she used a, uh, what she called a presumptive test or two presumptive tests. Are you, are you familiar with that concept? I'm familiar that there are two presumptive tests, and I know which tests that they're talking about. One of those was a test we commonly use with the Indiana State Police. Uh, this was in the middle of the time where I was with the Indiana State Police, and we used what we call the, uh, and I hate to use these long terms, but phenolphthalein. That was one of them, and, I, and I'm aware from communication with counsel that the other one was uh, uh, leukomalachite green, a second presumptive test. And how are those tests done? if you will. Well, I've been made aware through counsel that it was a swabbing, and this is common, what uh, an analyst will do in the beginning of looking at the bottom um, uh, part of the dress. They'd swab off that area, and then that would be consumed for the presumptive tests, uh, which in this case for Area F5, was they were both positive. For blood? Yes. She, um, again, we're going to focus on F5. She testified that she uh, used a swab is for these two presumptive tests, and then um, she, I believe, also took a cutting from F5. Is that your understanding as well? That's correct. So would the swabs that would be used for these presumptive tests also be used for testing for DNA? No, typically not, and I don't believe there's any reason to believe that that's the way that worked. You, you wouldn't want to do that with the DNA. The, you're already adding chemicals to that uh, cuttings from the swab. You typically want to go back and collect a cutting, and we know from the, the holes that we can see in that area that one cutting was collected at least there in uh, 2005. So in making a cutting like that, how would, how would Ms. Sauer or any criminalist be sure that they were getting a cutting from the same place that they got the swab to determine that there was blood present? Well, you can't be absolutely sure. Uh, one thing if, is if you've circled the area uh, with, with the white, a white marker, then you'd have a pretty good idea of where to go back and collect your cutting. But if it's too difficult to see where you need to mark, you certainly don't want to go and mark uh, over an area that might be an actual stain where you're hitting the marking. And this is why sometimes analysts, uh, and when I did the same kind of analysis, sometimes I would circle, a, uh, circle an area that was very clear where I could see where stain was. But if it was uncertain, you don't want to put markings on there, so you're going to have the challenge of going back and trying to hit the area you just swabbed as best as you can. Could swabbing actually remove DNA from a, from a site? It, it could remove the body fluid. It can remove the, the, the goal is to get uh, enough material to, to see a, a positive blood test if there's one to be had there. Once you've consumed that swab and you go back to collect a cutting, uh, there's going to be a challenge to, to figure out wh where that is. And yes, you may have removed any, any percentage of that uh, blood area, whether it's 50% or 90% or more. Uh, you're not going to really know. You know, there was uh, other testimony in the, the uh, case about the presence of blood on the steering wheel of the Martinko vehicle, and there was uh, <clears throat> identification, retired identification officer White testified about taking a lift from the steering wheel to uh, raise uh, blood off of the steering wheel, and, and that uh, item H, are you familiar with item H from the steering wheel? Yes, I am. And was there any DNA uh, detected on item H? Well, first of all, as I understand, there was a swabbing collected of that, that tape lift, and the swabbing showed uh, the positive blood test similar to Area 5 on the dress. And so there, there was an indication of blood, but the DNA, uh, there was no DNA typing information that was interpretable there. Hmm. Would, would uh, blood, if it was present on that lift, uh, typically hold DNA? Well, blood is an extremely rich source of DNA. 
uh, within a single drop of blood, you're going to have about 400,000 DNA con containing cells. Uh, so th this is going to be very rich. If, if you have even one two thousandth of a drop of blood, if you can wrap your brain around that and imagine that tiny amount, that would still give you enough DNA to get probably a full profile. So it may have been that on that steering wheel tape lift, the blood might have been removed completely by the initial swab to do the presumptive tests. Okay. So was there an indication um, in Ms. Sauer's analysis of the Area 5 that Ms. Martinko's blood was at Area 5? There is some indication that that might be the case, and typically with blood being a rich source, uh, we see very little information that's pointing to Ms. Martinko there. There is a mixture on the Area 5 results, but the very low-level added person in the mixture, it's a, what we call a major-minor mixture. The major was not her. The lower-level uh, um, information that was there had some consistency with Ms. Martinko, but it was very, very little genetic information. But intuitively, you would assume uh, that if you have a few markers there that point to her, that it's her dress and there is blood in other areas of the dress. Well, you m I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Doctor, this being a mixture, and in that mixture was a male profile. Yes, so, there was. So is there any question that there was a male, that there was male DNA at Area F5. Area F5 on the lower part of that dress, there was male DNA. There's no question about that. And although we've heard it was not a complete uh, male profile, <clears throat> do you agree, based on what you've read, what you understand from the trial testimony in, in this case, that that male profile is consistent with the profile of Jerry Burns? Yes, there's a, a clear consistency there with Mr. Burns. Now, Ms. Sauer testified that she could not be certain that the tiny bit of male DNA, and was it a tiny bit of male DNA? It was, it was a low level amount of male DNA. It was not what we call low copy number DNA, and that's where it's really a very trace amount. Uh, but it was a very small amount of DNA, and it doesn't take much in the modern day, and 2005 really counts. Uh, DNA is more sensitive now, the typing is, but back then it was modern day typing, STR typing, very sensitive, and the amount that's there, even though it's in incredibly small, uh, was more than enough to get typing information. Okay. And again, she testified that, um, that, the, that she could not be certain that that male DNA came from blood or whether it came from saliva or whether it came from mucus or sweat. Um, and she, I think, uh, acknowledged in, in answering a question from uh, government counsel that the blood could not be the only explanation of the source of that male DNA. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And I believe uh, Mike Schmidt testified as well that he could not be certain where that male DNA came from. And would you agree with that as well? I, I agree with him as well. Um, I want to ask you just a few more questions about the <laughs> testing that Ms. Sauer did and the DNA yield um, at that site. And if we could... Approach again, Your Honor, with Exhibit, Defendant's Exhibit T1. You may. Could you tell us, please, what uh, Exhibit T1 is? Uh, yes, this is uh, labeled as a case summary sheet for PowerPlex 16. Now, this is the platform of testing that was done. But it all, it's also summarizing what the DNA yield results were. Um, and in this instance, uh, there's a column here showing uh, the, the amount of DNA, the total amount of DNA that was recovered from that cutting. And would this uh, exhibit help the jury understand your explanation of the uh, potential sources of the DNA at F5? Perhaps. It's, it's numbers on here, and they, they need explanation. Explanation? Yes. Okay. We offer a defendant's exhibit T1. Has the state had an opportunity to review the proposed exhibit? Yes, Your Honor, no objection. Okay. T1 will be received and made part of the record. May we uh, publish that, please? You may. Uh, highlighted on exhibit uh, T1 is uh, well, first of all, if you could explain the columns and uh, what those columns mean for us, please. 
uh, the, the far left column is identifying what the uh, exhibit is. And we have highlighted F5, and that's the most important one to look at. Uh, it shows extraction date, uh, but also where it says quanti blot. And this is an old technique that's, that's what I was using with the Indiana State Police as well. We've upgraded that to something called real-time PCR. But back then, it's in the real-time PCR, can be inaccurate on measuring uh, the DNA. This was even more inaccurate. So it's, a guess, it's an estimation. It's a guess of roughly how much DNA is in these samples. That's where it says result, and it says NG slash, and that's the next is a Greek letter mu and an L. That's, that's the concentration of the DNA. So it doesn't tell you the total amount of DNA there. It tells you how concentrated it is, uh, much like as if you make lemonade. Um, if you take a whole can of frozen lemonade and put it just in a, a quart of water, it's going to be way too concentrated to drink. If you put it in a huge vat, uh, you'd barely be able to taste it. That would be not very concentrated at all. So what we're doing here is we're getting a measure of what the concentration is. You also need to know how big the amount is. And perhaps if it's a drop, uh, that would be you take the number there, which is zero, um, 0 0.062, and you multiply that times 50 if you have a drop that's 50 microliters. So uh, can you tell us... Uh, <clears throat> based on what's highlighted there for exhibit F5, either how concentrated or the amount of DNA that Ms. Sauer was able to extract and examine? It's not very concentrated. It comes out to if you have a drop of DNA liquid, which is what you want to have. You don't want to have a whole full tube this big of DNA. It's too much volume. You don't need all that. And you don't want to have such a small amount, you can barely even use a pipette on it. So in between that is about 50 microliters, and that would be three nanograms. And I can explain what a nanogram is. I have to do that now. Please. A, a nanogram is one billionth of a gram. So to help juries understand, visualize that, if you know how much material is in an equal packet or a Splenda packet, they put exactly one gram in there. So it's a billionth of that. So if you were to take an equal packet and dump out the entire amount right here on the the, the stand here and throw away 999 parts and only keep one one thousandth of it, you have a milligram. If you were to then try to divide that little tiny pile by another thousand, throw away 999 parts and you have what's left you may not be able to see. It's about the spe size of a speck of dust. That's a millionth of the original equal packet and you're still not there. You've got to divide that by 1,000 again, throw away another 999 parts, and you're down to something you can't see without a microscope. That's a nanogram, and it's a billionth of a gram. We have about three billionths of a gram uh, from this cutting from Area 5. Of <clears throat> DNA? Of DNA, and that's the total DNA that's in there. Now, the, the majority of it does appear to be from a male. And there is a second source in there uh, that may be Miss Martinko, but it's going to be most of that three nanograms is going to be from the male that's present. So if the male DNA at, at, at area F5 from the cutting that Ms. Sauer took had come from blood, would you expect to, that she would have found more DNA than what she did? Uh, much more DNA, but just to give you an idea, if you had one eight hundredth of a drop of blood, that's going to give you about three nanograms. If you divide a drop, typical size drop, about 50 microliters by 800, the number of cells you'd have in there is going to be about 500. And that's 500 cells. We know exactly how much DNA is in every uh, nucleated cell. And that's going to be, uh, come out to three nanograms. So what we have down there, if that was blood from that area, all blood, uh, that would be about one eight hundredth of, of a drop. But she didn't raise that much. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Yeah, she didn't uh, didn't find that much. She she found the the three nanograms of material, but we don't know if that's blood or if that's some kind of uh, other source of skin cells or transfer or uh, talking uh, that can get onto a microphone, uh, spittle, mucus. Uh, we don't have any identifying information other than the preliminary blood tests that occurred before the cutting was taken. 
So <clears throat> um, asking you this differently, based on, on what we know from what she was able to extract and examine at Area F5, and based on the reports that you've read about the crime scene, about the testing of the car interior, the purse, the steering wheel, the seats, the door handles, the area around the car, is there any indication based on that information that the man or woman who killed Michelle Martinko had cut himself or herself? No. And why do you say that? Uh, well, we, we don't have the amount of DNA that you typically get from this area where there's male DNA, for example. Uh, if uh, we're looking for a foreign profile, we have one, it's at A5, but the amount of original DNA that was in that cutting uh, is not consistent with what you'd normally get from blood unless you're talking about an incredibly small fraction of a drop of blood. And there's no trail anywhere else, as you mentioned, a purse, uh, the, the seats, uh, other areas in the car, or perhaps a trail of blood drops leading away from the car. I saw nothing in the description of the crime scene that supported that there would be a, a person, a perpetrator cut and spreading little bits of blood in various places. Now, we know uh, from a testimony earlier in the trial, uh, Dr. Spence, and uh, from examination of the, the dress, Exhibit uh, 7A, that the dress was sent to DNA Labs International. Are you familiar with uh, that laboratory? Yes, I've reviewed a fair number of cases that, where they were involved in the typing. That the dress was sent there for some additional cuttings from the, uh, around the area of F5. And what can be made of the fact that DNA Labs International was not able to extract or locate any DNA in the vicinity of F5? Well, we know that within the vicinity of F5 that there's no white markings, which isn't necessarily a mistake, as I mentioned. If you don't feel like you should mark it, then you don't want to put marks on top of an area that's, that's important. Uh, these areas were very close in tight, but a little bit away from that central area that Ms. Sauer collected and none of those four areas showed any indication of blood uh, or uh, interpretable DNA. So what that tells us is that at least that far out, we've got a void space with no uh, sources of DNA. Now, um, after Linda Sauer isolated F5 and uh, tested it, and uh, I believe it was re-examined by DNA Internationals, was there any indication from the material that you reviewed that there were any further examinations of the dress for any other DNA? Uh, no, I don't believe that there were any uh, additional areas that were examined for either blood or foreign DNA uh, okay. on, on places where there might have been some kind of transfer event or some kind of a body fluid uh, de deposit anywhere. Any indication that the scarf that uh, Ms. Martinka was wearing was ever examined for the presence of DNA? No. Well, knowing that she attended a, a banquet at a hotel <clears throat> the, the night of her death and was at a shopping mall in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the night of her death, would you expect to find other DNA on her clothing? Objection. That's, uh, that's pure speculation. Um, can I have a of the witness? You may. <clears throat> Dr. Spence, um, so what exactly have you reviewed as a result of this case? I've reviewed uh, all the reports. There's a, uh, about 42 of them. Uh, in order to, to uh, uh, examine this case, I've uh, looked at all the supporting documents from that. Uh, I focused most of the, the work on these, uh, uh, the work from Ms. Sauer. Uh, I reviewed the, uh, the, the uh, televised uh, testimony of Ms. Sauer. Uh, it, that's, that's all I reviewed within the, the televised information. Oh, and excuse me. So you've been watching this trial as it's been happening? That, that part of it, I did review the testimony from the opposing DNA analyst, yes. So you knew you were going to be a witness and you watched that testimony? Yes. Okay. Um, did you review any of the, um, or watching the testimony from the um, lay witnesses who were present at Westdale Mall that night? No. The, I, I know that the trial's gone on for quite a few days and I wouldn't have time to review. I, I focused com entirely on Ms. Uh, Sour. Did you review any of their previous witness statements about their interactions with Michelle? Uh, no. Uh, well, that might have been in the actually in the police reports. I might have seen some mention of those, but it's not really pertinent to the science. Okay. <clears throat> and that's, I guess, where I'm getting here then. So did you see anything within the uh, witness statements, police reports, anything, anything like that that indicated 
um, a circumstance that uh, would have led to uh, Mr. Burns' DNA being transferred to Michelle Martinko's dress or her car? Well, it would be hard to discern uh, Mr. any involvement with Mr. Burns uh, so in that, that way. Is that no, then? You didn't see anything like uh, that? I know that Mr. Burns did uh, go to that mall on occasions. I don't think there was any statement that he knew he had been there on December 19th of uh, 1979. Beyond that, um, other people's DNA perhaps being on her clothing, uh, I'd have to, it, it's hard to, to trace back to who might have touched the dress on that night. So with regard to Mr. Burns, did you see any indication from any of the, the discovery uh, whatsoever, any of the reports that there was a circumstance on or about December 19th, 1979 that would lead uh, Mr. Burns' DNA to be on Michelle Martinko's dress? Uh, no, I don't okay. believe. Uh, I don't believe so. No, Thank it's you. not in there. Then uh, we object on the grounds that this question calls for pure speculation, Your Honor. Well, it's not speculation, Your Honor. He's a scientist, and he's uh, talked about trace DNA, and, and this is a question that goes directly to his ex expertise. May I respond, Your Honor? You may, Your Honor. Under the rules of evidence, five point seven. Uh, Zero three uh, regarding expert testimony. Um, the basis of an expert testimony um, has to be based on facts or data in the case that the expert has been made aware of or personally observed, uh, and it has to be uh, the type that they would reasonably rely on um, to form an opinion on the subject. And also under 5.701, expert testimony has to be valuable to uh, determine, sorry, 5.702 to the, help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or determine a fact and issue. And there's no evidence upon which this opinion would be based. This is pure speculation. Um, and putting a, a, the certificate or the seal of an expert on this opinion would be improper um, because it's no more than uh, any layperson could speculate. Any further argument, Mr. Spees? No, Your Honor. This is well within the realm of the uh, the expert's expertise and uh, his explanation of how an item of evidence would be examined. The objection will be overruled. The, um, the jurors will, as the uh, fact finders, the judges of the fact in, the, in this case, will determine um, what weight to give all the evidence that they have they have heard, all the testimony that they have heard, uh, including uh, any opinion uh, given by Dr. Spence. But he will be permitted to answer the question. Uh, and the question that was pending was, well, knowing that she attended a banquet at a hotel the night of her death and was at a shopping mall in Cedar Rapids the night of her death, would you expect to find other DNA on her clothing? So you may answer that question, sir. I think I would expect to find uh, DNA from others on anybody's clothing, uh, as long as they've worn it for any amount of time. And you can even have wash clothing, uh, clothing items that people have... Uh, worn for, let's say, years, and they're actually washed and dried, and you test those for DNA, and you can have DNA on those as well. Sometimes even the washing or dry cleaning is not going to remove all the DNA. But if you're interacting with other people, there are going to be instances such as the spittle that I accidentally put on this microphone just talking to people. You can get DNA on your clothing from that. Just by your interaction with other people and your contact with other surfaces? Yeah, if, if you touch the other people, if they talk around you, if they leave DNA on an item and you come over and sit down next to it uh, or on it, those kind of things, uh, th this is how transfer events do occur. So <clears throat> since um, 2005 when uh, Linda Sauer isolated and examined F5, uh, DNA labs uh, attempted unsuccessfully to find other DNA in the vicinity of Area F5. Um, to your knowledge, from your review of the investigation, was there any other effort made to 
determine another male source of DNA on Ms. Martinko's dress? Uh, be beyond December of 2005, no. Stated differently, in pursuing and focusing on the male DNA profile in F5 and what may have been found on the gear shift, item I, again, was there any attempt to identify any other male profile in the car, the dress, any place in the crime scene? Yeah, there's other garments. Uh, those were, the, nobody went back and examined those garments. Once a male profile was found, there was additional uh, um, examination of what was on item exhibit I, the, the gear shift, uh, the, the area of the dress F5, uh, and there was typing done on known males to try and identify whether or not those happened to be the known male who was on those areas. But there was no additional searching through other garments or other um, items collected from the car to, to see if there was another male. So was F5 the kind of the end of the road scientifically? The, the end of the road except for trying to identify who that was, yes. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for you. We're going to stand in recess for about uh, 15 minutes. I'm going to give the jury an opportunity to rest uh, before we hear.